All right, my name is Larry Crow. I'm interviewing today with the History Makers. Our videographer is Matthew Hickey. Sir, could you please state your full name and spell it for us, please? Alvin Alonzo McFarlane, Jr. McFarlane is spelled M-C-F-A-R-L-A-N-E. Okay, and Alonzo? A-L-A-N-Z-O, Alvin, A-L-V-I-N. Okay, and what is your date of birth and place of birth? September 15th, 1947. Born in Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, we lived in Kansas City, Missouri. Okay, all right. And uh, what is your occupation? I'm the owner of uh, a company, McFarland Media. McFarland Media is uh, primarily Insight newspaper, weekly community newspaper in Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota. We do media buying, we do radio and television production. I produce and host a regular weekly radio program called Conversations with Al McFarland. I produce a companion television show for public access television by the same name, and quite often the television show uh, audio is used for the radio. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is today's date? Today's <coughs> date is, uh, what, June 20th, uh, 19, 2018. And where are we at the present time? Right now we're at my office. I call it the Marcus Garvey House. The address is 1815 Bryant Avenue North. Minneapolis, Minnesota. All right, and uh, now, uh, why do you call it the Marcus Garvey House? I'm a Jamaican, and okay. my hero is Marcus Garvey, and uh, I resonate with the idea of, um, of uh, up you mighty people, you can become what you will, be who you are. And so the spirit of Marcus Garvey, I think, is something that resonates with my, my own uh, sense of uh, wanting to be and do and demonstrate to myself and to community uh, our potential as human beings. Okay, all right. And um, now, uh, before we go into depth, there are five lightweight questions we always ask that only require a short answer. Mm -hmm. First one is, it's kind of a warm up. First mm -hmm. one is, do you have a favorite food? Hmm, no. Okay. Uh, uh, I can come back, let me think about it. <laughs> uh, what I'm making my favorite food is uh, arugula, uh, tomato, and um, what else? That's it, arugula and tomato. You're a dedicated man. <laughs> <laughs> you have a favorite color? I think it would be uh, somewhere between yellow, blue, and purple. Okay. You have a favorite time of the year? No. Uh, favorite vacation destination? Uh, I love Jamaica. I've not been, but I love Cuba. So my intent is to make Cuba my favorite vacation destination. Uh, I visited Ghana several times. I love Ghana. I visited Uganda. I love Uganda. Okay. Uh, and the last question is, do you have a favorite phrase or saying? Hmm. I'll think about it. <laughs> Let me think about it for a second. It, it, uh, does your paper have a motto? Yeah. Uh, the three I's, to inform, to instruct, and to inspire. Okay. So that's it. That would be it. Okay. All right. Now, I'm going to ask about your family history. Okay. I'm going to ask about your mother's side of the family and your father's side, okay. but we'll start with your mother's side and then we'll put them together. How much editing do you do, first of all, on None. these? None at all? Everything straight through? Okay, great. So, uh, so, so if I grab my paper towel, that's part of the interview, that's right? Okay, that's, that's fine. fine. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Uh, can, can you give us your mother's full name and spell it for us? Uh, her name is Maxine Sykes McFarland. Maxine is M A X I N E. Sykes, S-Y-K-E-S, -E last name McFarlane, M-C, capital F-A-R-L-A-N-E. And, and what is her date of birth and place of birth? Uh, she was born on March 23rd, 1926, in Sunflower, Mississippi. Okay. Now, what can you tell us about your mother's side of the family? How far back can you trace them, and what are the stories on that side? Well, uh, she is alive. She lives in Florida. She's 92 years old, I guess it would be now, 92, 93. Yeah. Uh, she says, I'm almost 100. Uh, she's experiencing Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, right now, she lives with two sisters, uh, my sister Patricia, my sister Roz, who uh, provide 24-hour care for her, her. She's still mobile. She's still healthy. Uh, her weight's under control. And she's, uh, you know, she gets around. Uh, she says that if she has to, she can drive, and that she's thankful that she can walk. Her, fa her favorite phrase is, I can stand up, uh, reach to the sky, bend over, touch my toes, 
and for that she is very grateful. So that's her frame of mind. But she repeats that all the time, and that's kind of what keeps her going all day long. Uh, her, she is known in our community as Queen Mother uh, uh, Maxine McFarland, and she adopted that uh, persona uh, and uh, presented it through her work and life in Kansas City as a community organizer and as a church leader. Our church affiliation on my mother's side is Pentecostal Church of God in Christ. And uh, over the years, she worked uh, to sort of advance the uh, memory of uh, a first cousin of mine, uh, Bernard Powell, uh, was murdered at age 33 uh, in Kansas City, Missouri. Bernard had created a community organization called the Social Action Committee of 20. In fact, there's a portrait of Bernard on the wall here over my uh, uh, right shoulder. Uh, okay. So Bernard uh, was a, a bold and aggressive voice. I think he had some uh, affiliation with uh, uh, the U.S. movement and perhaps with the Panthers and perhaps with the Solovinsky community organizing. So he was mm -hmm. an organizer, activist, uh, a radical, uh, and uh, uh, some would say revolutionary in Kansas City, uh, but uh, his life was ended prematurely. She uh, took it on herself to not let his life, uh, not that she alone could do it, but to ensure that his memory was um, uh, uh, honored and worked over years to have the park that we grew up in across from the Powell House named the Bernard Powell uh, a, a memorial set up. Uh, and the memorial is a statue, a life-size statue of Bernard Powell in a fountain with a time capsule in it. And she and neighbors and neighborhood uh, did annual commemorations, marches, celebrating the life, vision, and work of Bernard Powell. So that committed her and reflected her commitment to social activism uh, Bernard's uh, favorite phrase was, each one teach one, uh, and he believed that we had uh, an obligation to, uh, so to speak, fight the power to stand up uh, against injustice, to stand for freedom, to promote voter registration, to promote literacy. He believed we should promote uh, quality of life, uh, making sure that people were able to earn uh, living wages and uh, have productive lives. And do that where you are in your neighborhood, but also uh, be about that in a global sense so that your values uh, that you practice in daily life align with your view of the world. And so he um, did things that connected him with kindred spirits around the country and perhaps around the world. She recognized that and celebrated that and tried to and has uh, kept that memory alive uh, through memorializing the life and work of Bernard Powell. Uh, now, he was your cousin. My first cousin. First cousin, right. okay. And can and you tell us what happened? I can, yeah. I can. He uh, <clears throat> announced he was going to be running for the state senate from the district we grew up in, in uh, Kansas City. And uh, at one point in time, uh, there appeared to be friction within the group that he created. The group was called Social Action Committee of 20. And as I understand it, I was not there. As I understand it, he had a, uh, created a, an affiliation of young Turks, young leaders, uh, each of whom had uh, emerged in positions of responsibility in the uh, social sector, in the um, community NGO sector, and they created a, an organization among them that advanced each of them individually and advanced the group. And so and as a group- In, in Kansas City, In Missouri. Kansas City, Kansas City, Missouri. Okay. Uh, their uh, base of operations was 27th and Prospect. Uh, he became known as the mayor of 27th and Prospect, or the mayor of Prospect Avenue. And uh, there was a, a dispute like one evening after some rally. One of the young people that was uh, uh, a person he had mentored uh, challenged him, accosted him, and point blank uh, shot him in the head with a 45 caliber pistol. Uh, the theoretical reason was that uh, the kid wanted promotion to uh, head a new community center or gym that Bernard's group was creating. Uh, what the real motive was, uh, you know, uh, is not known. Uh, there's speculation, but nobody really knows. Well, was the assailant apprehended? 
Yeah, he, I mean, he was us, us apprehended and convicted, went okay. to jail. Yeah. yeah. All right. So yeah. was there any other motive uh, ever? Well, the, the, ever the speculation stand? is politics is political, and uh, was this a person that uh, was easily influenced and who was disgruntled mm -hmm. and uh, was able to be pushed, you know, into doing something that was unthinkable by somebody who had other motives? Okay. And so, so, so that's that, that's that, speculation in the community. It's yeah. not known. It's not uh, you know. So the, the, he was agitated by somebody else. That's right. To do this. That's and right. Somebody that's right. that maybe had been a loose screw anyway was agitated around. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's, that's so, so 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 what, what what year about what year was this? You know. Uh, see, I can't remember. Is it the '60s, '70s? No, 80s? it would have been in the um, let's see, it was '70s. '70s. Yeah, late okay. '70s. Okay. Uh, yeah. So your mo your mother um, was an activist. Um, can you go back and um, and she was born in Sunflower, Mississippi. Is mm -hmm. there a story about mm -hmm. her ancestors in Sunflower? Mm -hmm. uh, any stories about emancipation mm -hmm. or or what they you know what kind of com community that was and and how she grew up? You know. Yeah, I uh, <clears throat> went to where she was born when I was like four or five years old. I met my um, great grandmother uh, at the farm they lived on in Sunflower. I have a photograph of my great-grandmother on the wall behind you. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, another photograph of the great-grandmother when she visited us at our home in Kansas City. Can you tell us her name? Yeah, the great-grandmother was Lizzie Harrison. I think her, her name would have been Lizzie or Elizabeth Splond, S-P-L-O-N-D. Harrison. She married uh, uh, Ali or Ali, A L L I E, Harrison, which would have been my great grandfather. Uh, and uh, my connection with Lizzie, the great grandmother, is that I remember walking uh, to a shed outside of the house, the shack house that we lived in. It might have been a big house, I don't know. I was four. And uh, I saw this big. Uh, number five uh, t size barrel, I guess it's not a, a regular barrel, full of cotton. And I just remember the beautiful, fluffy, white cotton spilling out of the barrel and I reached in and you know, wanted to touch the cotton. She must have a spoon or something wooden in her hand. She cracked me across the knuckles and said, don't put your hand in there because you don't know what's in that. Could be a snake. So that was my lesson that I remember her by. And I call that a lesson of love and instruction. Uh, I realized, uh, so I have another photograph of her uh, when she visited us in Kansas City. I'm, again, four years old, maybe five. My cousin Bernard and his twin brother Brunel are sitting beside me. The three of us were like triplets. Uh, they, Bernard and Brunel, the twins, are six months older than me. And um, so the three of us are sitting at the, in the floor, cross-legged. Uh, the other uh, cousins are sitting all on the floor. On the divan are uh, Bernard and Brunel's mom, we called her Mrs. Powell, Aunt Teola, Teola Powell. Uh, Mr. Powell, who was like the patriarch of the family, he owned the house we all lived in. He also owned businesses on 18th Street in Kansas City. Uh, he was holding uh, their youngest child, uh, Teola Powell Jr. We called her baby sister. Uh, next to um, Mrs. Powell probably was uh, my grandmother. We called her Big Mama. Her name was Martha Harrison. And next to her was her mother, uh, the uh, uh, Lizzie, great grandmother Lizzie. Another great a sister of hers was there, and my mom was there. And so uh, I went to see 12 Years a Slave, the movie a few years ago when it came out. And this picture I've had of our family with me as a kid, four years old, has been on my mantle for like 40 years. You see it and you don't see it. And so I came home from the movie uh, just impressed like everybody else was at the uh, horrific uh, story uh, being told about our, this person's uh, enduring and coming out of slavery. And uh, got home, sitting there thinking, all of a sudden, uh, this photograph starts glowing, it seems. And I get up and go look at it, and I think about my grandmother, this person I knew, and I remember how old she was when I met her. 
and the light bulb went off. This woman was a slave. Hmm. She was born in she was when she, she was she alive. Was, during slavery. When she was born, hmm. she was the property of another human being. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. It hit me. I said, so I, I've been in meetings with white people here in Minnesota where they say, uh, I had nothing to do with slavery. Don't tell me about that. It's not a problem. That's back then. That was then. This is now. And I don't want to talk about it. And I don't want to be responsible for anything that anybody did. If they did it, it wasn't me. My people just got here, et cetera. And you need to forget about it. And so my answer uh, kind of came from this uh, epiphany experience. Uh, that wasn't that long ago. And this is personal. And I actually was loved by, held by, corrected by a human being who, when she was born, was the property of other human beings. So that's the connection uh, that personal to Al McFarland and the slave experience. I knew a woman personally who had been enslaved. Her children, their children, and me. That's how close it is. So I cannot forget, I will not forget, and that memory sort of informs everything I do every day. Not that I live in the past, but I must remember and I carry it with me in how I interact with anybody and everybody right now. So that's a, a story about the family. I had the, <clears throat> the DNA uh, done with a African ancestry and 23andMe, those two. Mm -hmm. And uh, I told my mother that our DNA uh, reflects that her lineage, my matrilineal side, uh, is consistent with uh, the, at a level of 99.5% with the Yoruba people of today. Mm -hmm. And so for all uh, practical purposes, in the matrilineal sense, I am and she is Yoruba. So uh, I claim Yoruba kinship, Yoruba bloodline through my matrilineal line. Uh, so. Uh, and so she had already began presenting herself and also had been, you know, addressed as queen mother. So she sort of plays the role and is, is a Yoruba queen. She's a queen. And they call her queen mother, Maxine McFarland. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, the Sykes family is big. Mm -hmm. uh, she, um, her father, I didn't know. She knew him. That's a family story. Uh, she said that they called him tied tongued. Uh, but as she thought about it, she said he might have been from the Bahamas. He might have been from somewhere where they just spoke differently. Uh, but her father was also m murdered. Um, he was a man who had a small uh, piece of land that he owned, and it was productive. It fed his family. Uh, the story is he was an independent, uh, righteous type of man, no-nonsense man. And uh, uh, didn't take low when he was expected to in front of white people. And white people didn't like it. And so one aunt tells the story of uh, riders, a uh, horseman riding up, uh, asking him to come out with their intent of killing or lynching him. And uh, the daughter said she came out, she's probably a teenager or younger, but stout, and said, y'all not gonna kill white folks, y'all not gonna kill my, my papa. You know, and they said, she's crazy, let's get out of here, we'll come back and get it later on. He didn't die that time, but at a later date, they say, uh, he was poisoned, and the poison came either from somebody black or somebody white who befriended him, and uh, they either drank something or ate something, and the consequence was uh, he died. And so the poison uh, was the payment for not uh, being subservient in attitude and, and respectful to the white uh, people in the community. Uh, he stood out, so now, that's the story. Now, was there an attempt to take his property? Well, they ended up becoming sharecroppers at that, from that point on. Well, they they lost, they, 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 they took the property, yeah. and none of them have any connection to that land at this point in time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
and they talk about uh, having to escape. Uh, their personal story uh, is that they, uh, one by one, left Mississippi by, uh, sometimes by night, uh, catching a bus on the highway, and uh, because they could not leave uh, in a way that was formal, where people knew they were leaving, because they probably were debts to pay, debts owed to, uh, you know, the share company uh, uh, people. Yeah, that, that's a situation where a sharecropper was always in debt. Yeah. He never could pay it off. That's right. Because he was paid by the landlord. Yeah, yeah. Who right. knew how to keep him in debt. That's right. He <laughs> stayed in debt forever. Yeah, absolutely. Right. right. So that's the story. So that's kind of one of the stories they hear in the family. Um, so so they, that's how, is that how the family got to, to uh, Missouri? They came up one of... Um, the sisters, I think, came, Mrs. Powell must have come up first uh, and married Mr. Powell, and then one by one, as I understand it, the family moved and migrated. I, I know that when I grew up, uh, my earliest memories were being a kid in the Powell house. We call it the Powell house, the big house, because it was just a huge, like, duplex or triplex brownstone uh, on 28th in Brooklyn, Kansas City. And so the Powells themselves lived on the first floor my grandmother uh, and grandfather and maybe an aunt in their family lived on the second floor. Uh, my dad, my mom, my older sister and I lived in a two-room sort of kitchenette. So it was a kitchen, uh, kitchen, I don't think there was a bathroom because there was a, a porta potty, mm. uh, a potty for the kids in like a little attic crawl space. So there was a sink and then a a small room with a table, and that was our living room space. And then there was like maybe two bedrooms, and that's what it was. So we grew up there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can, can you give us your grandfather's name? Who was who was poison? Alan Sykes. Okay. Alan Sykes. Sykes, big family, big clan, and uh, I'm sort of learning uh, through the genealogy and the DNA uh, how connected that family is. So what I what I'm hearing, but I don't know this for sure, is that um, all across northern Mississippi, uh, lots of Sykeses, and uh, I don't know that the Sykes family, Sykes men, uh, were not, uh, you know, part of, of creating uh, black people, black families. Um, and some of the families had two, some of the men had two families generations apart. Like, I think uh, Alan Sykes probably had one family that was already grown and gone when he came and met and uh, took my grandmother for a wife. One story I heard from, I think my mother was that uh, either he was a itinerant farmer, you know, and at one point in time came and saw his future wife, my grandmother, uh, Martha, she went 13 to 14, and told her parents, uh, Lizzie and Ollie Harrison, uh, I want that one there, y'all save her for me, and y'all come back. And he came back and got her and married her. So that's the story I heard now. I don't know how the marriage stuff works or not, mm -hmm. but that's the story it's told in the family. And so he must have had a family with a number of, you know, offspring previously, because he might have been 50 you know, when she was maybe 20, or he might have been 40 when she was 20. Big age difference, I think, yeah, so, okay. yeah. Okay. Now, um, um, okay, now, uh, now did your mother have a chance to uh, uh, finish school and? She finished high school so, okay. in Kansas City. She came uh, and was way behind, but she was very smart, and she uh, got into school in Kansas City and just, uh, did well and finished high school in Kansas City. Yeah. Okay. Did not go to college. Did, did she have a, a special talent or profession that she followed? Or? Well, she was good at, I think, sales. Uh, and she worked for a Jewish uh, dry goods store uh, in Kansas City. She learned Yiddish. She spoke Yiddish. <laughs> you know. And uh, uh, then when she left working for that company, she uh, worked for another Jewish uh, grocery store owner uh, right behind the Powell House on 28th in Brooklyn, and we ended up buying that grocery store. So we owned the grocery store, 
uh, and, but it was her connection uh, to the uh, Yiddish, uh, Jewish uh, store owners that enabled her to, uh, and our family to purchase that business. Okay, okay. Uh, sh her, her, her greatest talent was her devotion in the church world. So she was uh, uh, active and uh, spiritual in the Church of God in Christ, the Pentecostal Church. And we spent all of our young years in church pretty much, you know, several nights a week and all day on Sunday. You know that story all over the black world. And we were classic in that sense that we spent most of our growing up time in church. Now, um, now you're a junior, right? Because yes. Your father is Al McFarland, uh, senior. senior. Yes. Right? And what is his date of birth and place of birth? Uh, he was born on, I think, November 3rd, uh, 1923. And he was born in a place called San Luis, Cuba. Okay. San Luis, mm -hmm. is it L-U-I-S? L-U-I-S. Okay. Cuba. Cuba, okay. Yeah, and it's in the uh, Oriente uh, near Santiago de Cuba. Mm -hmm. All right. So, all right. So he's technically, well, he's, uh, did he consider himself a Jamaican or did it, or, he's or a Cuban? Cuban and Jamaican. Okay. His parents were Jamaicans okay. who went to Cuba to farm. They went at the turn of the century and they stayed in Cuba maybe 20, 30 years. Uh, all of his sisters and brothers, except for the youngest, were born in Cuba and uh, raised there. And then when the, they, uh, you know, things got really bad in the 30s, they came back to Jamaica. So okay. Yeah. Were, were, were they ever considered Cuban citizens? Or? Yes. Mm -hmm. The ones who were born there are Cuban citizens. Okay. And I don't know if the grandfather and grandmother took Cuban citizenship or not. I don't know that. Uh, but Jamaica, uh, Cuba has lots of Jamaicans. Okay, and, right. and Oriente and Santiago in particular uh, is like Jamaica. Okay, okay. Um, now, once again, like how far back can you trace your father's side of the family and what are the stories on that side? Well, I'm uh, g doing the same research uh, into the father's family and the mother's family um, through the DNA work. Um, Right now, we can trace my father's side back to, uh, I, I knew my father's father, but I didn't know my father's mother. She died in 59 before I ever went to Jamaica the first time. Um, and I know about uh, my grandfather's parents, say two generations back, I'm just learning about my grandmother's uh, parents a generation or two before her. Mm -hmm. I talked to somebody last week that I haven't met in person yet. I'll be meeting soon. Um, we're planning a, uh, a, a Riley, Riley Green family reunion in uh, Montego Bay in April of 2019. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother's, my father's mother's name was Daisy Ann Riley and she was part of a lineage called Riley's and Green's. Uh, when I uh, went to Jamaica the first time, my father introduced me to a gentleman who was his uncle, I think, called uh, Wendell Green. They called him Teacher Green. Uh, he was uh, either high school uh, headmaster, but he was uh, a person that uh, shaped and directed a lot of careers, I'm finding out, for a lot of young people. So my father introduced me to him and, uh, and uh, I'm learning now about that side of the family through uh, his relatives, his, uh, my cousins through him. Okay. Yeah. We have to pause here yep. for that. Well, okay. Pause. 